Without rigorous controlled testing, doctors are left to make educated guesses about how exactly to use the treatment. U.S. Food and Drug Administration recently gave emergency use authorization to convalescent plasma as a therapy for hospitalized COVID-19 patients. Plasma is collected from previously infected individuals to passively transfer antibodies in order to treat coronavirus patients. One of the many issues here is that there has been not that much research and testing conducted on COVID-19 convalescent plasma. This green light from the FDA is simply saying that it's safe to administer but this does not take into account the effectiveness of the treatment. However, President Trump spoke the other day stating that convalescent plasma reduced mortality by 35%. Is this number accurate? If convalescent plasma works, the emergency use authorization could save thousands of lives without regulatory red tape. But without rigorous controlled testing, doctors are left to make educated guesses about how exactly to use the treatment. Today, I'm here to discuss what we know so far about convalescent plasma and just how effective the treatment really is. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Jordan Wagner. I'm a board certified emergency medicine physician. And on my show, I answer your urgent medical questions and clear up myths about certain deadly diseases. If you haven't already done so, please make sure you hit the subscribe button and turn the bell notifications on. That way you are instantly alerted when I post a new video. Without rigorous controlled testing, doctors are left to make educated guesses about how exactly to use the treatment. Before convalescent plasma was only available for patients being treated as part of a limited extended access program. How does convalescent plasma work? Plasma is the yellowish liquid part of our blood that makes up the majority of its volume. It works like an internal highway carrying oxygen, red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, salts, hormones, and even cellular waste to their final destinations in our body. Plasma also serves as a key player in our immune system. When we get sick, our body's immune system makes antibodies specific to that pathogen. These antibodies then circulate in our blood plasma and help fight off the infection. If the same infectious agent returns, antibodies prevent you from falling ill again, or at least getting as sick as you were the first time. Convalescent plasma comes from people who have been sick with COVID-19 and have recovered. So it contains their antibodies specific to SARS, COV2, intravenously delivered plasma and its antibodies could help someone who is currently sick with COVID-19, providing what scientists call passive immunity. Beyond these basics though, plasma's role in treating COVID-19 is a little unclear. How did the FDA decide to give convalescent plasma an emergency use authorization? Convalescent plasma isn't a new treatment to the game. In fact, it's been around since the 1980s. Doctors used it to treat diphtheria and later the Spanish flu in 1918. There's been some research showing its effectiveness for other diseases such as recent pandemics like SARS and MERS. We have observed the benefit to the use of convalescent plasma and it has a good safety profile. The FDA and the government made an emergency use authorization to make it much more easily accessible for patients. Who can get convalescent plasma? Now that convalescent plasma has been given the emergency use authorization, Anyone hospitalized with COVID-19 can receive the treatment. You can also get the plasma if you're enrolled in an ongoing randomized trial, some of which look at how well convalescent plasma works for people who aren't severely ill. How much do they need? We still don't know how much plasma a person needs, who the ideal candidates are, or what the ideal timing of dosing is, or what concentration of antibodies within the plasma a measure scientists call the titer, are most beneficial. Convalescent plasma is far from a COVID-19 breakthrough. So where did Trump get this data to back the 35% reduction in mortality? That number referred to a subgroup of patients who were treated early in their disease, were under the age of 80 years old, and they were not on ventilators. That means that out of 100 people who are sick with COVID-19, 35 would have been saved because of the administration of plasma. This is incorrect. Much of the data for the emergency use authorization came from an observational study, a type of study that scientists said cannot be used to determine whether a treatment causes a decline in mortality, but it gives us some data. Such a conclusion can be only reached through a randomized clinical trial in which patients are prospectively assigned to either a group that received treatment or one that doesn't. So it might work in 35%, but we don't have good enough data to be definitive about that at this current time. So the bottom line is this, the FDA has issued an emergency use authorization for convalescent plasma therapy, a method that uses the blood of people who have already recovered from COVID-19 to treat patients recently diagnosed with the illness. 
The decision was based on research by the Mayo Clinic, which didn't use a placebo group. This makes it difficult to judge just how effective convalescent plasma therapy might be. Again, the treatment is safe, so there's a tendency to use it while waiting for more rigorous research. Emergency use authorizations have been revoked in the past when more information became available. For example, the anti-malarial drug hydroxychloroquine. All right, that's been a quick plasma breakdown with me, Dr. Wagner. Let me know in the comments if you have any other medical questions that you'd like me to answer. And as always, make sure you subscribe and turn on your bell notifications. Thank you so much for watching. Stay healthy, my friends. Heat and cold therapy are often recommended to help relieve aching pain that results from muscle or joint damage. Did you know that a hot compress can also alleviate a stomach ache? Which type of therapy do you opt for? A cold pack or a hot pack? Frequently debated among individuals, but did you ever really think about which one is appropriate? So you have a massive migraine or your arthritis is acting up, you're experiencing a pinched nerve or you sprained your ankle. Before you rush off and douse yourself in an ice bath, I'm here to break down whether cold or hot therapy is appropriate for your injury. Hey everybody, I'm Dr. Jordan Wagner. I'm a board certified emergency medicine physician and on my show, I answer your urgent medical questions and clear up myths about certain deadly diseases. If you haven't already done so, please hit the subscribe button and turn your bell notifications on. That way you're notified when I post a new video. For the record, in some cases, alternating between hot and cold compresses may be helpful, but there are many instances where cold only or hot only may be better suited for your injury. We are going to go over all of that today. So what exactly is cold therapy? Cold therapy, also known as cryotherapy, reduces blood flow to a recently injured area. Typically best if utilized within 48 hours of an injury occurring. This slows the rate of inflammation and reduces the risk of swelling and tissue damage. Cold therapy also numbs sore tissues, acting as a local anesthetic, and slows down the pain messages being transmitted to your brain. What is cold therapy useful for? A cold compress is best if you're experiencing an ankle or knee sprain, muscle or joint sprain, hot or swollen body part, or acute pain induced from intense exercise. A cold compress is best used on recent injuries, especially where heat is being generated. Cold compresses are not recommended for chronic back pain due to the fact that this pain is not new. Cold compresses aren't that effective on back injuries. This is due to the fact that the problem tissue that is inflamed is located deep beneath other tissues and far from the surface of your skin, where the cold compress will obviously lay. Back pain is often due to increased muscle tension, which can be aggravated by cold treatments. For back pain, heat treatment might be a better option, which we'll dive into in just a second. Again, a cold or a chemical cold pack should be applied within 48 hours from the time of the cause of the injury to the site in which you are experiencing discomfort. Apply the cold compress to the inflamed area for 20 minutes every four to six hours for about three days. You can also do 20 minutes on and 20 minutes off for about three rounds. Ice should never be applied directly to your skin. This can freeze and damage body tissues, possibly leading to frostbite. What are the types of cold therapies? A cold compress can be made by filling a plastic bag with ice or frozen vegetables and wrapping it in a dry cloth. A cold mask or a wrap around the forehead might reduce the pain of a migraine. For osteoarthritis, patients are advised to use ice massage or apply a cold pad 10 minutes on, 10 minutes off. When is it appropriate to use cold therapy? You should never apply cold compresses on an open wound or if an individual has some type of vascular disease or injury in which nerve disorders affects blood flow. So what exactly is heat therapy? By applying a hot compress to an inflamed area, this will dilate your blood vessels, promote blood flow, and help those sore, tight muscles relax. Our bodies typically build up lactic acid waste after physical activity. In an effort to eliminate that lactic acid buildup, a hot compress will promote circulation resulting in the elimination of the lactic acid buildup. Similar to lactic acid buildup in our muscles, our stomachs will build up a similar acid resulting in a nasty stomach. So next time you have a stomach ache, try applying a warm compress to the abdominal area to eliminate acid buildup. Heat is also physiologically reassuring. 
which can enhance the analgesic properties. Heat therapy is usually more effective than cold at treating chronic muscle pain or sore joints caused by arthritis. What is heat therapy useful for? Heat therapy is useful for treating osteoarthritis, strains and sprains, tendonitis or chronic irritation and stiffness in the tendons, warming up stiff muscles or tissue before activity, and relieving pain or spasms related to neck or back injury, including the lower back. Applied to the neck, heat may reduce spasms that lead to headaches. However, the effectiveness of heat treatment may depend on the depth of the tissue affected by the pain or the injury. What are the types of heat therapy? Electrical heating pads, hot water bottles, hot compresses, or a heated wrap. Soaking the area in a hot bath between 92 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 33 or 37.7 degrees Celsius, heated paraffin wax treatment, or over-the-counter topical medications such as rubs or patches containing capsaicin. Heat packs can be dry or moist. Dry heat can be applied up to eight hours, while moist heat can be applied for roughly two hours. However, moist heat is believed to act more quickly. Heat should normally be applied to the area for about 20 minutes, up to three times a day, unless otherwise indicated. Single-use wraps, dry wraps, or patches can sometimes be used continuously for up to eight hours. When should I not use heat therapy? Heat therapy is not appropriate for all types of injuries. Any injury that is already hot probably won't benefit further from warming it, especially burns. Stick to cold therapy for that. Similar to cold therapy, heat should never be used on an open wound, inflamed skin, or if you have insensitivity to heat due to peripheral neuropathy or other condition. Most importantly, always double check with your primary care physician about whether or not heat or cold therapy is appropriate for you. For instance, if you experience high blood pressure or heart disease, utilizing a cold or a hot compress could actually lead to a series of problems. Now doctor, what about alternating hot versus cold therapy or is that just a myth? Alternating between hot and cold therapy is also known as contrast therapy, can be beneficial in some cases, such as individuals who have chronic pain, such as muscle or joint pain. Both ice and heat bring something to the table in terms of pain relief and healing. However, choosing one or the other just might not provide enough relief. This is when contrast therapy comes into play. When cold is applied to the body, our blood vessels contract, or in science terms, vasoconstriction is occurring. When vasoconstriction is occurring, circulation in our bodies is reduced and pain decreases. Removing the cold causes vasodilation as the veins expand to overcompensate. As our blood vessels expand, circulation improves and the incoming blood flow brings nutrients to help the injured tissues heal. Contrast therapy reduces inflammation, stimulates circulation, and loosens up tight muscles relating to overall pain relief. It's the best of both worlds. Science has yet firmly established the effectiveness of heat and cold therapies, but neither treatment is very potent and the danger of an adverse reaction when applied to a particular point on the body is usually low. Individuals with chronic pain or a non-serious injury can try either method and find their own best solution. Let's recap. Cold therapy reduces inflammation by decreasing blood flow to the area applied within 48 hours after an injury. Heat treatment promotes a blood flow and helps muscles relax. If you're experiencing chronic pain, stick with this. Alternating between heat and cold may help reduce exercise-induced muscle pain or chronic conditions such as osteoarthritis. And as a friendly reminder, never use extreme heat and never put ice directly on your skin. All right, that's been a quick hot versus cold pack conversation with me. Dr. Wagner, let me know in the comments if you have any other medical questions that you'd like me to answer. And as always, make sure you hit the subscribe button and turn your bell notifications on. Thank you so much for watching and stay healthy, my friends.